Well, hey everybody, it's the end of the month. Actually, it's the beginning of June, so I lied. But that means it's another edition of the 100 Years of Movie series. This time we're tackling 1940 to 1950, and I'm really excited, but also I was really daunted going into this, this last month looking at all these films because there's so many choices. And I, I actually have uh, a list over here from 1951 to 1961, and it's even bigger. So that it's just going to get increasingly harder and harder for me to pick my favorite movie of each of these years. So hopefully you're in store for a, a, a good a little bit long video. I'm really excited to get this on the way. So let's actually talk about my favorite films from 1940 to 1950, starting with 1940. All right, so 1940 actually had a lot of movies to choose from. In fact, I actually have some honorable mentions right here. One being Pinocchio. This is one of the, the greatest animated films uh, of all time. It's got a really great story as well. We also have His Girl Friday with Cary Grant and uh, Rosalind Russell. A really good uh, just uh, newspaper story. I, I liked it a lot. It was really funny. We have Charlie Chaplin and the Great Dictator. One of the first movies he actually had uh, you know, talked in for the most part. And the iconic scene at the end, him as uh, Hitler, more or less. And uh, giving that speech was just, uh, you know, it's an iconic scene in a role. We also have Night Train to Munich. This is a Carol Reed movie. Um, this is just a really cool uh, thriller. I kind of Hitchcockian as well, but I really loved this movie. It's really uh, a fun ride to Munich, you know. Next is a Hitchcock movie, Foreign Correspondence, and this is actually the second Hitchcock movie we're, we're going to talk about in a second, but I'll show you the first one in a second. But I really loved this movie. Um, it's just, uh, it's a classic Hitchcock movie, and it's just, it's a really good time, and just, um, you know, it got a lot of classic tropes to it as well. Now my favorite movie that was actually the runner-up for 1940 was actually Rebecca, and Rebecca is actually my favorite, one of my favorite Hitchcock films of all time. This movie is just amazing, and I love this Criterion cover so much. But 1940 had a, such a good uh, amount of movies that I've seen uh, that year. But there's actually one movie that beats Rebecca for me, and it actually goes all the way back to my childhood. That movie could be Fantasia. And I'm talking about the first Fantasia, so not Fantasia 2000. This is a two-movie collection. I'm talking about the original Fantasia. This movie, to me, uh, sold sold me when I was really young. There's several moments of this movie um, that just really stick with me as a child, and also, especially like the end, the night on Bald Mountain, that piece really just terrified me. But So what is this movie? Um, if you haven't uh, heard about this movie, it's pretty much just a collection of classical score pieces from either were from like Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, Beethoven, Bach, all sorts of things, and it's and it's animation. And each of these scores and the, each of these pieces have uh, corresponding animation, uh, pretty much from you know visual artists' representation of what the music is actually showing. So yeah, I highly recommend this movie. Uh, Nine on Bald Mountain scared the shit out of me as a kid, and I remember it uh, for being so iconic and so emotional at the same time. That's what I love about this movie is it's emotional and it's also uh, just audi uh, audibly and orally, orally as in this, a fantastic time and I, I highly recommend this movie. Rebecca, you were really close, but Fantasia, you, you know, my childhood. So that's my pick for 1940. So let's actually move on to 1941. All right, so 1941 actually had a couple of picks that uh, I thought were really good. I've actually only seen three movies from this year, one being The Wolfman. This is an honorable mention. I really loved Wolfman. Uh, this is actually one of my uh, first uh, Universal Horror Monster movies that I actually saw. But I really love this, and I love this art. Alex, uh, Alex Ross, really good stuff. So it's not this one, and it's actually not Maltese Falcon, which is a really great uh, neo-noir movie with Humphrey Bogart, kind of one of the earlier forms of uh, neo-noir. And I really loved this movie, and I thought uh, it had a really um, a good uh, amount of twists and turns that I really liked in this movie. And I really liked Humphrey Bogart's performance. But the movie that won, it should be obvious, but the movie of the year, and pretty much one of the movies of all time, is Citizen Kane. This movie is just one of those movies that is just super iconic. Obviously it's on some of the top movies of all time and it's for a good reason because the shots in this movie, the score in this movie, the dialogue, it's just it's so odd and it, the juxtaposition of it all is just a, a precursor to a lot of the things that you see in modern film and the storytelling is really just really bizarre and strange. The camera angles, I love a lot of the things in this movie. I also didn't really appreciate it the first time I saw this movie because I was like, uh, this is just one of those film schnob movies, you know? 
so I really didn't want to pay attention. But Orson Welles uh, pretty much plays Citizen, he plays Kane, and uh, he, it's just the rise and fall of this guy, this entire this entire story, and you have that iconic ending, uh, which I won't talk about if you haven't seen the movie. But yeah, this movie deserves its spot in some of the uh, greatest movies of all time. So following Fantasia for 1941, we have Citizen Kane. So let's actually move on to 1942 for another pick that is pretty pretty obvious in my opinion. All right, so 1942 actually had a couple things that I've seen before, and uh, but it's pretty obvious just like with Citizen Kane. So some honorable mentions in 1942, I had Saboteur, which is one of the Hitchcock films. This is in my Hitchcock collection. I really love this movie. This is actually my introduction to Hitchcock besides watching The Birds years and years ago in high school. I actually watched this entire thing in order. Um, and I watched this before I saw Rebecca and uh, before I've seen a lot of other Hitchcock films, but I really love Salvatore and it, it just caught me by surprise on this, just pretty much this train ride. It's a really great film, but it's not that one. And it's actually not this classic, uh, Bambi either. Bambi is a really great film by Disney, but it's not this pick. It's actually the easy pick and that is Casablanca. It's one of the most romantic films of all time. And this movie is just iconic in its, its imagery, um, its performances, and just the overall aesthetic of the entire film. It just feels like a weird uh, romantic dream. I love that this, uh, this, the eeriness and the way it's shot and then just the, uh, the foreignness of uh, pretty much the country in Africa where they're at. And this, it's just area and you see this, this kind of foreign love and this love triangle. And I, I really love the performances by Humphrey Bogart and Inigo Birdman, and we also have Paul Henry. I want to say I don't know his name, uh, but this love triangle is just really compelling because you know you have this girl who's caught in the middle of this, and these two guys pretty much from her past and kind of the more in the future uh, tense and the present tense, I suppose. And it's just it's a really good performance uh, pieces on on all all fronts, and it's just it's one of those timeless films that you definitely need to see. And it's, it's one of those films that, in my opinion, is one of the greatest romantic films of all time. So I highly recommend Casablanca. So let's actually move on to some not-so-obvious picks to 1943. Alright, so 1943, I've actually only seen two films from 1943, so there's not much competition, and I honestly couldn't tell you which one I like better. So that's actually a, a weird thing, but I think I picked it. It's not this movie, so this is the honorable mention. The honorable mention is actually Shadow of a Doubt, another one of my Hitchcock films. This movie is just suspense like just through and through the whole time. It's a classic Hitchcock film and uh, it's one of those performances that I, I really love, um, especially by uh, Joseph Cotton. I really like him. We'll talk about him a little bit later, but I really loved this movie. But the movie that edged it out, and I mean edged it out just barely because uh, we're gonna have some kind of universal horror monster movie, and that is Phantom of the Opera. Now this is the 1943 remake. This is uh, with Claude Rains. We had the original with Lon Chaney, Jr., uh, Lon Chaney Sr., pardon me, in 1925, which I really liked as well. But this one is the only one that I don't have on Steelbook because I didn't put those on Steelbook for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's the rights or something. This movie is really good. It's in Technicolor, and that's one of the newest uh, kind of forms uh, that this, this, especially this story saw. And it's pretty much a theater story. So you're seeing you know, this phantom of this opera house and it's in this theater pretty much causing havoc. I mean, you know the Phantom of the Opera story. But I really love Claude Rain's performance. It's this egotistical maniac who is just going around uh, causing havoc pretty much just for this girl he loves um, and he can't have. And it's just, it's crazy, it's great. I love the dialogue and I love the performances involved and I really love this movie. So my 1943 pick is Phantom of the Opera. All right, for 1944, just like 1943, I've actually only seen two films. And the first one being Lifeboat, which is another Hitchcock film. And this one is actually a Kino Lober classics. And uh, I really like this movie. It's all set in one location. Uh, this, this submarine uh, submerges a ship. And it's, it's pretty much between Germans and Americans and a couple of British uh, personnel. And they're all in this lifeboat trying to figure out uh, who, you know, who actually like sunk the ship possibly and who's not to trust, who to trust, all that stuff. And I really love the compelling nature of this movie. But it is actually edged out by another film, and that is Double Indemnity. And this movie is a classic neo-noir, and it's actually probably our first on our list of the neo-noir movies. We have Fred McMurray, Mac Murray, and we have Barbara uh, Stanwyck here. Uh, with Edward J. Robinson as well, Edward G. Robinson. And I really loved this movie because it's just this weird 
take, and you kind of already know what's happening at the very, very beginning of this film. You have this insurance agent who is doing this in, uh, this policy on double indemnity of this, this rich lady who wants to uh, get this thing out uh, from her rich husband just in case he gets murdered somehow or he or he somehow dies. And so obviously he gets murdered near the beginning and then there's a lot of suspicion and a lot of things going on left and right and there's a lot of crazy things that go on in this movie. I love this movie quite a bit. I only have recently seen it so I can't give you a full analysis of this movie but I really liked the compelling nature and the dialogue especially. That's what makes Neo Noir uh, so perfect for me is the dialogue is so timely for uh, you know the the time that it is presented in and also you can watch it now and kind of appreciate the style of what is going on about it so I really loved Double Indemnity and I really love the concept of it and I would highly recommend checking out Double Indemnity for my 1944 pick so let's move on to 1945 the only movie I saw in 1945 and it was actually the last thing I saw uh, in general and I'm actually gonna read a little bit off this because I really can't tell you the much details because it's French it's Children of Paradise. This really long, epic French movie uh, from 1945. I love this gorgeous cover. Um, it's all set in this theater in France, and this is during the, um, I want to say 19th century, maybe late uh, 1800s. And it's pretty much uh, at the height of when the turn of the century is. And it's between four principal uh, males, so there's different people, I'll read it to you. There is an actor, a criminal, uh, a count, and then there's a mime, and that is uh, Jean-Louis uh, Bar Barault, and that's the main character in this movie that you, uh, you know, care about in this movie. And they're all pretty much going after this woman, and this woman who can't make up her mind, and that they're all in love with in certain aspects, one or the other, and they are, they're caught in this thing, and this movie is epic because it's like 190 minutes, so it's three hours and ten minutes so it's it's a crazy long movie but you see so many things in this movie from French society from the bars the courtesans the thieves uh, the aristocrats you see all this divide and you can kinda of see um, this uh, build up um, right after the the 1800s which that was pretty much when the multiple French revolutions occurred you can see the class divides between uh, all these principal characters and how much social Social classes actually mean in French society. It's kind of like Gone with the Wind-esque in its epicness because it, it covers such a long time span as well because part two starts years after part one and you see this, these transitions between all these characters, all these principal characters and I love the performances especially by the mime which Jean-Louis uh, plays so well and, and I, in fact I actually have seen um, that image several times randomly and I don't know exactly I couldn't pinpoint where but I've seen that face before that's where that face is from it's from this movie so definitely check out Children of Paradise if you can because this is my 1945 pick all right so let's move on to 1946 this is actually a really difficult year for me because 1946 had a lot of really good picks to choose from the first one being Notorious now this movie is notoriously high to get on Blu-ray. In fact, this movie is out of print for some reason, and I actually recently got this as the one of the last things that I bought, and it was, I think it's like $99 on Amazon, and I randomly from the third-party seller got one for 20 bucks. I think the next highest is like 40 or something like that, so I'm really happy that I got this. But I really loved this movie with Cary Grant and Inger Bergman. Um, it's a good movie. Um, it's a classic Hitchcock film. I wouldn't say it's fantastic. Um, I need to see it more. Uh, because a lot of the Hitchcock films kind of blend in with me. and uh, But it's a really good movie, but it's not my pick. Now, what you'd think is my pick for 1946 is actually It's a Wonderful Life. It's not. However, this is a, a movie from my childhood, and I've seen it multiple times during Christmas. Good God, what a, a, a jolly movie. A movie that just really kind of warms your heart and kind of just shows you how a good humanity could possibly become. Uh, especially in times of turmoil and this movie is just is just gorgeous it's a very emotional movie and I mean if you haven't seen this movie James Stewart and Donna Reed just um, James Stewart just, just destroys this performance and I highly recommend it's a wonderful life if you haven't seen it but that's not my pick my pick for 1946 is actually at a left field it's La Belle Olivette that is the Beauty and the Beast this is the French version of Jean Cocteau I want to say I don't think I'm saying his name right but well, this movie is just amazing. I was spellbound the entire time I saw this movie. I was watching it 
and there was just certain elements of it that were just enchanting and it's unlike all of the Disney interpretations of it and that's obviously what I grew up with so I really don't know too much about the original um, which I'm going to read in the, the back um, Le Prince de Beaumont uh, fairy tale of this movie that's the original uh, take on this but this is such an enchanting movie the, the performances uh, and I'm going to read off the paper because I can't read French names uh, but the performances in this movie, especially um, by uh, Jean-Marie, who is the Beast, uh, the makeup is just phenomenal. I don't know if you can see it in here in this, this little camera, but this, this Beast makeup is just astounding. And a lot of it is just so theatrical and, and dazzling, and I really, I'm really i using a lot of adjectives to kind of just describe this performance. It just really is enchanting. It's, uh, it just it drew me in, and I really love this movie, and I, I'm... I love this take on it, and I think this is one of the films that I've been waiting to see for so long, and it was such a great treat to see this, especially for my journey from 1940 to 1950. So my pick for 1946 is La Belle et la Bête, which is Beauty and the Beast, and I highly recommend it. So let's move on to 1947. There's only a couple movies that I saw in 1947, first being Monsieur uh, Verdot, which is a Charlie Chaplin talkie. This is actually years after his uh, performances in The Great Dictator. He actually kind of fell flat because a lot of uh, communist sympathies and socialist sympathies that I saw, a lot of people did not like Charlie Chaplin during this time period. So he came back with this kind of black comedy about a serial killer who kills a lot of women and gets you know, rich off of them. It's a really funny movie and it's just a really strange take on Charlie Chaplin. It's like the slapstick mixed with black comedy. It's, it's really bizarre, but it's not my pick. My pick is actually Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck. I actually really loved this movie. It's Gregory Peck, Dorothy McGuire, and John Garfield. This movie has Gregory Peck as a journalist in New York who pretty much wants to get to the bottom of this anti-Semitism. So this is right after the war. This is 1947. So this is a couple years after World War II. And so you see uh, anti-Semitism still around a little bit. And you, he's trying to understand what it's all about. And so, more or less, as this journalist, as he's trying to uncover this story, he actually pretends he's Jewish. And he pretends his entire family is Jewish as well, even though his wife is really not about it. And his, his child, and you see that in the movie, is, is pretty much tortured and bullied by other, other kids because of that. It's such an empathetic film, especially for its time, and it's actually a little bit, um, I want to say, because I looked a little bit into it, I want to say it was a little bit um, controversial for its time period, because I don't think the world was ready for something like this. So I highly recommend Gentleman's Agreement. This is a great film uh, by Eli uh, Kazan. So I would say check out Gentleman's Agreement for 1947. All right, for 1948, this is actually one of the most difficult years for movies that I had to pick from. The first being The Treasure of Sierra Madre with Humphrey Bogart. Actually, this is kind of like a weird combination from 1947, 1948. I couldn't really pin, pinpoint exactly when this came out. Uh, it says 1947 on here. It says 1948 on the internet. Uh, so I picked it for this. Uh, it was a great film. It's actually one of the first ones that I watched for this entire series. I really loved it. I love the performances just in these in this mountain range, just trying to hide this gold that they find. And I just really love it. And it's just, it's like a a Western that, you know, is almost anti-Western at the same time. But it's not The Treasure of Sierra Madre, and it's not actually The Red Shoes. And I really love this movie. In fact, this is actually my third favorite movie of the year. I really uh, drew into this movie of this love triangle. A lot of love triangles and love quadruple things involved in a lot of these movies. But I really loved this movie. I really loved the performances in this movie and also just the theater life that is ex examined in this movie. And it's actually not this movie, They Live By Night, which is this really dark Nicholas Ray movie. And you can see just the, the under, underpendings of uh, just American society, of the people that no one cares about. And I really love this movie because of that. And it's actually not probably my favorite Hitchcock movie of all time, which is my favorite one of all time, and that's Rope. I really loved Rope because I love movies with one location in it. I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. But I really loved James Stewart's performance in this movie uh, as this mediator between this murder that happens at the very beginning and they hide the body in a very not so obvious but obvious at the same time uh, spot and they have this party and they're pretty, pretty much trying not to get discovered but at the same time they're they're trying to get infam um, they're trying to get discovered because that's what killers want to do they want to be infamous they want to be known but they also at the same time they they, they walk that tightrope but it's not rope. It's actually an Italian movie, The Bicycle Thief. 
Bicycle Thieves. Um, it's it's called either or. But this is a film by uh, Vittorio De Sica. I want to say I'm very bad at Italian, but I really loved how moving this mo uh, how moving this picture was. This movie uh, follows this guy and his son, um, but this is post World War II Italy, so it's really poverty stricken in Rome. You're seeing pretty much just people, you know, walking around in, in ruins and rubble and pretty much just not having jobs. And this guy, he picks up uh, his job and he gets a bicycle for it so he can, you know, run and do his job and feed his family and all that. But the first day he starts doing it, his bicycle gets stolen. He figures out who it is. He pretty much the whole movie with him and his son, who is just, a, you know, a little probably like seven year old boy, maybe six. He's really young. And more or less he's going on this this journey trying to figure out who stole his bike and it's just it's moving it's got all sorts of uh elements of drama comedy uh some just heartfelt moments coming of age kind of moments there's a lot of really great things in this movie and the ending you just don't really see it coming but at the same time you kind of do based on what happens in the movie you're kind of like i expect this character to be like this because of the implications of what happens in the society that you're seeing it's it's got a lot of social implications it's got a lot of uh, humanistic implications i really loved this movie i highly recommend checking out bicycle thief or bicycle thieves either way but this is my 1948 pick all right so let's move on to 1949 uh, another hard year for me to pick movies from but i only actually watched two movies from 1949 the first being late spring by uh ozu and i really loved this movie I actually recently saw this movie, I actually talked about it, I think, in one of my videos. I like this movie quite a bit, but it wasn't my favorite pick. It shows pretty much post-World War II uh, Japan. You see just the society trying to figure out the, the divide between the different generations, and I really loved to see that, especially in one principal character who doesn't know what she wants in life and in love. And so, but my favorite pick is actually a Carol Reed movie, and it's The Third Man. We you got Orson Welles on that cover right there. Joseph Cotton, I told you we'd talk about him again, who plays this, uh, this author from America coming over to England and getting involved in this crazy, crazy drama film noir. And I really love this movie, Dutch Angles. That's all I have to tell you about this movie, Dutch Angles. It's, there's so many Dutch Angles, and I didn't even realize uh, I knew really about that until I saw it. I'm like, that's weird. I've seen this before. and But they do it really well in this movie because... Uh, the movie and the score, the score is so bizarre and I love it. It's so um, upbeat and it's so clashing with the tone, but it also makes sense. It makes complete sense with what's going on. It's just this crazy frenzy uh, of a movie and I really love the performances by Joseph Cotton. Uh, Alita Valley is the woman and Orson Welles, of course, and Trevor Howard as well. Um, but you, it's just this crazy movie filled with lots of um, iconic scenes. There's one particular one, but I don't want to give anything away because this movie is just filled with so many crazy things going on. And so definitely check out The Third Man. Uh, I'll gush about this movie. It's one of my favorite movies that I've seen. Definitely my favorite soundtrack besides Fantasia out of all the movies that we've talked about. I really love this movie. All right, so let's talk about the last year, 1950. Before we get to 1951 through 1961, let's talk about uh, 1950, which is actually an amazing year for film. There's two movies that I saw in my honorable mentions that I did not make it, the first one being In a Lonely Place. This movie is another Nicholas Ray movie, so we talked about him briefly with They Live By Night. I really love this movie. It's really dark. You've just seen the screenwriter who is just more or less just defeated. Humphrey Bogart is just, he doesn't really know what to do, and you just struggle with him as he's trying to get uh, through his life. And speaking of screenwriters, another movie that actually didn't uh, didn't make the cut was Sunset Boulevard. This is actually probably one of my favorite movies and one of those movies that kind of reminded me a lot of Great Expectations, which by the way, I hate that book, love this movie, and I haven't seen the Great Expectations movie at all, but a lot of the elements of this, this crazy old ex Hollywood star from you know the the Roaring Twenties and the Silent Era, um, and the early days of Hollywood, pretty much washed up, uh, running into this screenwriter who's running away uh, from some people who are after him, and he needs to make a film, and so he just gets connected with her, and it's just crazy, crazy movie. I love it. It's a classic Hollywood movie, and you've probably heard of it. So, but it wasn't my pick. My pick is actually an Akira Kurosawa film, Rashomon. I absolutely love this movie. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. This is a story that is a psychological thriller 
uh, about this one event that happens. It's about uh, four people who are involved in a murder of a man and a rape of a woman. And these four people all saw different angles of it. You kind of see that in like a bystander effect kind of thing. And I really love the testimonial aspect of this movie because you see different stories, but you, you kind of figure out eventually how things actually turned out, what events happened. So you have four different people, and I'm going to read them off to you because they're different types of um, people in Japanese society during pretty much uh, the Tokugawa era. <clears throat> so you have a priest, you have a woodcutter, you have a bandit, and you have a commoner. And uh, you're introduced to Toshiro Mifune, which is the main character of this movie, and you see him iconically in several of Akira Kurosawa's samurai movies. You'll see him a lot more in the future when we talk about the 1950s. But I love this movie. I love movies shot in one location quite a bit, and we'll talk about some of those later on and when we get down the line. But I really loved, um, I really love Rashomon. It's my favorite movie. It's it's a movie that I just keeps me glued to the screen, and I just constantly want to watch it more and more. I loved it, and I loved all the aspects. I love the spiritual aspects of it too. It gets kind of crazy at the end, and uh, I I like that ridiculous um, theater aspect of Japan, the kabuki kind of culture uh, that you see in the Japanese theater, and I really love that aspect as well in this film. So that's it for my films. So that was all of the years from 1940 to 1950. I had quite a list, eh, a lot of lists, there's a lot of stuff there, a lot of stuff here, and a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of stuff that we went through. But those are my picks, thank you so very much for checking this this uh, video out. I am tired, it's also getting really hot, so I want to hear your thoughts down below on what you thought of my picks. Did you like my picks for 1940, 1941, 43? What do you think? Anything different? What would you your picks be down below? Tell me those down below, please. Uh, give this video a like, don't forget to share this video, and also subscribe, and I'll see you next time. I'm not Jones and around.